Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you <clears throat> are alive and well. <clears throat> and God, that you've actually honored us to give us a mission so phenomenal in this world, in this age. Might we be excited about hearing your marching orders and just use us in any and every way you can to glorify you now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, we just saw, again, finishing the book of Philippians, didn't we? Um, how, uh, the, uh, how Paul signed his death warrant again when he said, All glory be to God the Father and not to Caesar. Uh, and you'll see that in almost every book when you start looking at it and when you realize that the reality of it is just not just for believers to think of giving him glory, but to, uh, that that's what everybody is to do. And uh, so anyhow, we're picking up where we left off. And I uh, did a little yellow marking so I would know for sure where we left off. And uh, we're in the last section of this first mandate. And as it reads there, uh, uh, let me put this down here. Every biblical mandate in this book is important. There's basically three of them we look at, but if you are not first fully convinced and fully grounded in this first biblical mandate, which you could summarize Jesus' civil mandate. We've seen scores of verses in the New and Old Testament, but actually the Great Commission in itself is a civil mandate because we're to disciple the, the nation state. We're to immerse or the... Uh, the word baptism can also, in the Greek, uh, it, it can be immerse, and one of the, the Greek meanings of it means to overwhelm. Uh, and I think that's kind of the thought when he says to, I don't think he meant literally to, you can't, you can't baptize a state. But that's the, con, that, that's the word, the pronoun for the Great Commission was, was not individuals, it was the state. You, but you can immerse a state, you can... Uh, overwhelm a state with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them, those nations, to do all that Jesus commanded. So uh, if you're not first fully convinced, fully grounded in this first biblical mandate, Jesus' civil mandate, the rest of this book will really be irrelevant to you. And God actually has far more in his scripture on this first biblical mandate than on the institution of the church or family combined. So let God's biblical foundation on this first mandate go down deep in you as he may want. Therefore, listen a little bit more. We want to read what God says here in uh, Romans. And he is God, the one who rules over everything. Again, I mean, he just signed his death warrant there again with Caesar, sending that to, the, to all the Christians in the city of Rome. God's the one who rules over everything. Caesar said, I'm the one who rules over everything. Paul said, no, God rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Let it be. So let it be. That's what amen means. So let it be. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is tended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. So let it be. Now he is far above any ruler. He's not just above any ruler. He's far above any ruler or authority, or power, or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of who? Christ. And has made him head over all things, not just the church, but he's made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. Christ is head of the church, but he is also head over all things for the benefit of the church. In other words, God has ordered the state to be for the benefit of the church. Isn't that exactly what Paul said to pray in 1 Timothy chapter 2? Remember when we went through those verses? For the benefit of the church, the benefit of all Christians. The state is for the benefit of the people of God, to follow God, to worship God. But to, the, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God. Notice, he said, to the Son, your throne, that's Jesus. Your throne, O God, here he calls the Son, God, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice, Hebrews 1.8. 
But it is God's plan and delight to rule through his people as we already saw in Scripture, both now and forever. When Jesus comes back, he will insist that his people rule over every nation. And the, and the Scripture uh, teaches that, as we've already seen. In the past, we saw how God ruled through his people, quote, by faith these, his people, overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them, Hebrews 11.3. The very first step of God's people ruling here and now on earth as he desires is for his people to have faith for it. That's why we're going over these scriptures. You can't believe something you don't have knowledge about. Faith is the first step for anything. Salvation for being saved. It's the first step in any area of obedience. It's the first step in everything. For God's people to start ruling in nations, cities, they have to believe that that is God's mandate. And if people aren't going to be saved, that's fine. They can be in that state, but they're to live under God's rule. This is what Hebrews 11 is all about. Look, those that did overthrow kingdoms and ruled with justice were only those of God's people, were only those of God's people that had faith in God, for in them to accomplish that. This did not happen by accident. They had to have faith for it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6 But most Christians only look back at the great works of God or in some distant future when, he will reign, when they will, we will reign with Jesus. Those of faith living today will believe God for today. We always want to look back. We always want to look in the future. But, the, but God wants today to get glory wants to fulfill his mission through you and me today. What did Jesus say we would, uh, would do in our day? Well, I left a lot of words out there, didn't I? I'm going to write that in. Say we would do in our day. Right before Jesus left this earth, he said what we should do today. Quote, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes, anyone, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I go am going to be with the Father. Even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Now read how Hebrews 11 starts. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Hebrews 2, 12, 1. God is saying it is now our time. He's saying it's our time. And yes, our mandate today is to disciple nations, to conquer them with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember some of the literal Greek meaning of the word baptize, baptize as in Matthew 28, 19, is to immerse or overwhelm. So as with Jesus' great commission, it actually may be more understandable to have it read to overwhelm them, the nations, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God gave to Moses and then to Joshua only one promise to accomplish their mission to conquer nations. And this is it. I will be with you. It's the only promise he gave them. I'll be with you. Isn't that exactly what Jesus, God, said to us after he gave us our mandate and commission to disciple the nations? He said, lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. So that's still today. Jesus said, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, overwhelming them with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He gave the same commission, and he gave the same promise. The end of the age is not over. This mandate is for us today. Any Christian that doesn't see Jesus' mandate to us today greater than any of God's mandates 
And Jesus' promise to us to assure our victory for our age, then that Christian is without hope. Look what God says every one of us are. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possessions. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of this darkness into the wonderful light, 1 Peter 2, 9. In the New Testament, there was no clergy lady system like that of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, every Christian is a priest, which is where we get the word clergy. Even one of us, every, even one, every one of us needs to be, editing this as we go, every one of us are royal priests, i.e. royal clergy or royal leaders. The Apostle Peter himself declared this when he said that all Christians are royal priests. We have been adopted into Christ's royalty. We have all been, what? Called. People say, hey, you've been called. Well, look, you've been called. We've all been called. And you've been chosen. You've not just been chosen and called to go to heaven, to be saved. You've been chosen and called to be royalty which means to rule, to be royal leaders in God's world mandate for today. In fact, that is exactly what royal means. It means kingly, royalty, or to rule. We are not to be ruled by the heathen, but it is God's mandate that his people are to be the rulers and to be a holy nation. To think anything less than this is an insult to our king who has made us royalty with his authority. But royal priests must have a nation and yes, Peter continues to say, we Christians make up a holy nation. And remember, Jesus commanded to seek first his kingdom, or else, or as the New Life Version states, seek first the holy nation of God. As Christians, we are first holy priest, and then royal priest, to make up a holy nation. Proverbs 14.34 says, Godliness makes a nation great, but, since a, but it's a disgrace to any people. The people of God should visualize themselves for what they are, a holy nation, and then set out to make their nation and all other of God's nations holy. Therefore, the godly must lead and rule. As God said, Christians should not be the tail or on the bottom, but the head and on the top. Quote, If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you, the Lord will make you, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you will always be on top and never at the bottom. Really, our, the United States became so strong and great because it, unlike few nations in the world or even in history, honored God in so many ways and God made them great. Look, there's other countries that are larger geographically than the United States, much larger. There are countries with far more population than the United States, much more. God is the one and the only reason the United States grew to be so strong and prosperous. And as it forgets its God, you will see its prosperity and its destruction begin to fold, as we're seeing today, as people are saying. Look how Peter stated this verse in 1 Peter 2.9. He said, you Christians are a chosen people. He did not say in the next life, you will be royal, but rather now you are royal. You are to rule now. There's no such thing as being royalty and not, you don't have royalty if you're not ruling. So Christian, think like it, act like it, and get on with getting up his holy nation, his kingdom now, here on earth as it is in heaven. That was the prayer. Here on earth, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said to first seek his kingdom here and now. You have heard of shadow governments within a nation. If Christians are not living a, in a Christian nation, this is exactly what Peter is saying to have, a shadow government. We must have a growing holy nation within a nation. If Christians live out and demonstrate their holy nation within a godless nation and know what that means, they will transform their godless nation into a holy nation. That was his, that was his promise, to be with you to do it. We will look at how that is done more closely later in this book. 
But for now, look at this. We're still on the first mandate. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ. Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. You know, I granted, I am extremely redundant. <laughs> I have been for weeks. But you just need to see, the Bible is just, New and Old Testament is full of this, and the evangelical world is just blind to it, like Israel was blind. Think about it. When Israel left Egypt and go into the Promised Land, they say there was three, four, maybe five million Jews. Did you know they were all blind but two? Joshua and Caleb. The only two. The rest did not have faith. They did not believe God. They were blind to what God wanted, and they spent their whole life just piddling away. Yeah. Out in the desert, the whole nation, all God's people in the world, except two. Don't be led by the majority. God is looking to raise up a man. Remember in the prophet, he said he's looking for a man. Just one man to stand in the gap. I want to tell you, don't make your decisions based on the evangelical world. It says in Romans, let every man be a liar. God is true. Look, you hook up with God. We're hooked up with God. Hook up with your Father. Hook up with your Father. Your Heavenly Father. Look to Him. Look to His Word. All glory, majesty, power, authority are his before all time and in the present. In the present. And all beyond all time. Amen. Jude one twenty five. Do you see what Jude is saying here? If this is to be true for the present, then it is clear God does not want his present rule to be any less today than beyond all time. Think about it. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. For Jesus Christ to rule through the kings of the earth, that must certainly mean with his written law. He wouldn't want to rule with any other law. He has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve as God and Father. To him be glory, power forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1.6. Here it is again. We need to see he has made us now at this time to be kingdom of priests today. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful true witness, the ruler of God's creation, Romans 3. I should never be, it should never be our theology to think God ever wants any of his creation to be rebellious and not living under his law. It is for that reason we are commanded to pray and work for nothing less than this. Okay? And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. For sure, when Christ comes back again, he will have his way with his people. However, some manuscripts don't read will reign, but read they are reigning. We will later see the many times through history where the godly have reigned over nations. And some godly are pursuing that in some nations today. We will look at this later as we go through the book. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord. The Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King, the nations, O King of the nations and of the ages. And our age is no exception. On his robe, at his thigh, was written this title, King of kings and Lord of lords. If he is to be king and lord of all kings and all lords, that would have to include all kings and all lords of our age as well. Look back at the Old Testament again. The wisest man that walked on the earth was Solomon. He wrote in Proverbs 8 and Proverbs 14, Because of me kings rule, and rulers make just decrees. Rulers lead with my help, and nobles make righteous judgments. Godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. This makes clear that this would be God's desire for all nations in all times. The prophet Isaiah said, Listen to what I have done. You nations far away, and you that are near, acknowledge my might. Come here and listen, O nations of the earth. Let the world and everything in it hear my words. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Let the whole world glorify the Lord. Let it sing his praise. 
This is through Isaiah 33, 34, 37, 42. Even during the days of Israel of old, the prophet Isaiah was making it clear that God's word was to be embraced by all nations, far and near. And all nations are to glorify and sing his praises. It was never just for Israel. And some nations at that time, in addition to Israel, did honor his word and glorify his name. God did not intend for the Mosaic law to only be for Israel, but for all nations, as these verses clearly demonstrate. Later, when Israel dishonored the Lord and God dispersed them to other countries, God continued to use his faithful ones, Daniel and his friends, to help influence and rule the most powerful nation in the world at the time, Babylon. And because of their political leadership and influence in Babylon, they impacted every nation in the world to honor their God. Quote, King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders of the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how wonderful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. That's because of Daniel. So God reigned in Israel when he had godly men like David and others. When those godly men were in pagan nations, heathen nations, they eventually took over preeminence in those nations to rule. And God was glorified through those nations. This happened many times throughout the Old Testament during the age of Israel. God was never interested in only Israel to honor him, but rather every nation. Israel was intended to be the model for all the other nations, and was at times, despite often falling short. Today, God wants his holy nation of Christians, his holy priest and royal priest, to be the model for all nations and to disciple them. But when Israel stopped honoring God and his people were scattered to other countries, God then used his faithful servants in other countries to carry out his holy political mission to influence other nations to glorify God. But this was always and only accomplished through God's holy people ruling those nations. In Babylon, God raised up Daniel and his colleagues. In Persia, God used Esther and her uncle Mordecai. It says in the book of Esther, and the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head. Do you, can you, you, don't, you can't realize the implication of that. No king ever, ever put the royal crown on any woman's head. But not with Esther. She was an impressive young woman. She was incredible. And of course, when we've gone through God's family plan, we see how her uncle was, uh, in essence, uh, her, her real father had died, and she was under the headship of her uncle, and her uncle Mordecai, she was so honoring of Mordecai. In fact, it was because of Mordecai that God raised her up to be in the position she was. But that's another subject. But he was so delighted with her, he put the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vishti. Though Esther had become queen, it was against the law of the land for even a queen to ever go uninvited into the king's presence. To enter uninvited to the king would mean immediate and certain death. In those days, the kings, they had these big, what you might say, rangers, <laughs> or green berets, or seals, or whatever, and they were surrounded. So if anybody ever came in unannounced, immediately, immediately, they would throw their javelins unless the king got his scepter up first. I mean, if he was snoozing off or something, he'd have wake up and there'd be dead people all around. This was a really, a, nobody went to the king uninvited. Or it was certain death. And those men were to immediately do it. That was their order. When somebody came in uninvited, to immediately kill him if the king himself did not immediately raise his scepter. During Esther's time, the lives of all God's people were now under edict to soon be exterminated. So Esther said, though it is against the law, you got that? Though it is against the law, I will. In this case, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. Wow. We need Esther's today. 
This was political roulette at the highest stakes. But in faith, Esther walked uninvited into the king's throne room. And God being with Esther, the king raised his scepter before the guards thrust their javelins through Esther. Esther lived and went on to save all the people of God and ended up destroying all the enemies of God's people instead. Esther's uncle Mordecai was also very courageous and strategic in all the political intrigue to protect the people of God. You see, the state is for the purpose of the people of God. And you see that so clear in 1 Timothy chapter 2. They were to pray that the people of God would have peace, that the people of God would be viewed with dignity and everything related to the people of God so that all men could come to the knowledge of the truth and by it be saved. God doesn't have the state for heathen. He doesn't have the world for heathen. He doesn't have anything for people that rebel against him. In his mercy, he may let them carry on and be patient, hoping they will repent. But it's, he, didn't, he didn't create it for rebels. He created hell for Satan and those that would rebel with Satan. That's what he created the, the heathen for. He created hell for the rebellious, not the earth. But it was only because of Mordecai's faith that he was courageous and tenacious, where he ended up not as the tail, but at the top of the civil political world. Quote, and Mordecai had become a palace official. The king took off his signet ring and gave it to Mordecai. For Mordecai had been promoted in the king's palace and his fame spread throughout all the provinces as he became more and more powerful. God used Mordecai's political power to save and promote God's people. And all the nobles of the provinces, the highest officers and the governors, and the royal officials helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai. And many of the people of the land became Jews themselves, in other words, people of followers of God, because they feared what the Jews might do to them. Now, maybe some were hypocritical, I don't know. But it's better to feign obedience than to publicly flaunt disobedience. King Xerxes imposed a tribute throughout his empire, even to the distant coastlands. His great achievements and the full account of the greatness of Mordecai, whom the king had promoted, are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Media and Persia. Mordecai the Jew became the prime minister with authority next to that of King Xerxes himself. He was very great among the Jews who held him in high esteem because he continued to work for the good of his people and to speak up for the welfare of all their descendants. Realize the state, every nation, is for God and his people. And it's the grace of God, it's the mercy of God, that the strangers, as they were referred to in the Old Testament, the non-believers, can be blessed living under God's people and the law of God. But they must live under the law of God. That's true in the Old Testament. That's true in every nation. It's true today. But if we don't have this understanding, we will abdicate to the non-believers, which we have in many countries today, primarily because of the United States American theology that has changed in the last 200 years and with its power and influence has influenced Christianity all over the world and, and left out what the majority of the Bible talks about, God's civil law and God's civil state that he wants to be head of. To be a part of God's people in those days you were a Jew or became a Jew through faith and then started following God's word. But what we see here in Esther is exactly what Paul was commanding Timothy to have the Christians pray for in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. And many Christians in the last 2,000 years have understood what they were to pray for, have prayed and worked to that end. And many have seen nations raise up to glorify God as we will also see later. The young boy jo Joseph, another one of God's faithful ones in the Old Testament, was sold as a slave to Egypt. But it is always God's desire to have his people influence and rule the nations for his purpose and glory. Young Joseph even dreamed of him, himself ruling. When you think about it, it really is the same basic mandate that God gave from the beginning to subdue the earth and rule. That was what his dream was about, him doing it. 
God wants his people to influence and lead in every nation so his people will be protected and respected and have the greatest influence for his purpose and glory. Despite the fact that young Joseph went from being an outcast from his family to being sold as a slave to a foreign country and then imprisoned indefinitely in a prison dungeon in Egypt, he never lost faith of God's ruling dream for him. Because of that, when the opportunity came, now think of it, he had been in this dungeon, he had never seen the sun for we don't know how many years. When the opportunity came, Joseph not only interpreted Pharaoh's dream about the national catastrophe that was coming, but was immediately ready to tell Pharaoh what kind of a person he needed to choose to save the empire. And it was a perfect description of Joseph himself. And then Pharaoh appointed Joseph the same day to be over his whole empire, the most powerful empire of the world. Literally, in a matter of hours, young Joseph went from a dark prison dungeon in Egypt to ruler over the most powerful empire in the world. That, talk about just to get out of that dungeon would have been a state of shock. <laughs> but then to have been brought in and say, now you're over the world in a matter of hours. For most people, it would be a shock just to be out of prison and see the sunlight again, but not for Joseph. You see, he was ready to rule the world that very hour. Joseph never stopped believing God's mandate. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand, placed it on Joseph's finger, he dressed him in fine linen clothing, hung a, hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down, kneel down, as Joseph rode through the streets. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zephanathah-Benaiah, I guess. I'm not too good at that, but I know what it means. God speaks and God lives. He said, this is going to be your name, Joseph. Think if somebody comes in the door, hey, God speaks and God lives. <laughs> How are you today, God speaks and God lives? Every time they addressed him, addressed him they said, God speaks and lives. <laughs> That's a great name. What's, what's your son's name? Oh, God speaks and lives. <laughs> I like that. It's good to know you, God speaks and lives. Come again, God speaks and lives. Wow. And they bowed down everywhere he went. Can you imagine the world impact that Joseph made? What a testimony for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob was Joseph's father. This was during Egypt's world zenith. I mean, these were godless, putrid nations. Babylon, Egypt, I mean, it was disgusting. But God, because these men had faith for what God wanted to do in the world. And Pharaoh proclaimed the glory of Joseph's God to the world, declaring Joseph's name to be God speaks and lives. Generations later, there was another Pharaoh that did not honor God or his servants. So God displayed his sovereignty and kingship over Egypt through miraculous plagues. God has never limited his kingship to that of just over the nation of Israel, even during the early days of Israel. But God has always made it clear that every nation should submit to his authority in all the earth. He is to be God over all the earth. All right, Moses replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hands and pray to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hell will stop, and you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord. It is God's will that all rulers everywhere at all times submit to the king of kings. Quote, so Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Hebrews, says. <laughs> Can you imagine walking into it? Should we not walk into the presence and say, President, this is what the Lord wants. This is what the Lord declares. This is what you're to do. You see, the people of God do not realize that God is on the throne. And any ruler, any civil ruler that's not ruling according to God is in treason. Is treasonous. 
and does not have God's authority or power. You do. I do. That's why we're royal priests. This is what the Lord, the God of Hebrews says. How long will you refuse to submit to me? How long, civil leader, will you refuse to submit to God? Throughout history, God continues to destroy all nations that do not submit to his lordship. No nation in all history has ever fallen when they were honoring God. Let's read that again. No nation in all history has ever fallen when they were honoring God and his law word. That's really how you demonstrate your honor of God, is following God's law. Only after they turned away from God and his law word, then they were destroyed. All Israel sang, the Lord will reign forever and ever, Exodus. In context, this was a song for the Lord's reigning here on earth in the context of Exodus 15, 18. Forever and ever, here on earth. In another place in Exodus, ungodly people attacked God's people. God's people were not told to run or to be passive, but rather to go out and fight. Exodus 17, 9. A few were to only lift up their hands in prayer, but most were commanded to engage the attackers. Think of that. It was an exhausting battle going back and forth, but in the end, the Lord's people did obey and engage the opponent. God gave them the victory. After the victory, listen to what the Lord said. The Lord said, they have raised their fist against the Lord's throne. So now the Lord will be at war with Amalek generation after generation. Now this verse is interesting. That's in Exodus 17, 16. Where was the Lord's throne that Amalek raised their fist against? Why don't you answer that? Amalek specifically raised their fist against the people of God. You see that in the verse? They've raised their fist against the Lord's throne. It was against the people of God. God's throne rests with his people. God then and today reigns and rules through his people. Not independent, through his people. The Apostle Paul said the same thing in the New Testament. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God? The temple was the holy, political, religious, civil center for Israel. That was where all authority, all decisions, that was like the, 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 the Congress or the Pentagon. Don't you realize that all of you together, now you're the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God lives in you? I mean, the temple was... That was, that was the center. That was the holy braille, as we say. God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. That's us. That's us. God will destroy anyone that destroys the people of God. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. In every generation, it is his will to rule on earth through his people. God's people are the Lord's what? Throne. God's people are the Lord's temple. He reigned from his temple. King David said in Psalms, how can the wicked praise his name? They can't. That's why God wants the righteous to reign. The righteous can praise his name. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us, Romans 15, 4. God is ready and more anxious than we to bring about his glory in every nation, every generation. Look, this is why we're going after verse after verse. If God could find anybody or any critical mass to believe what he says, he would work, he would operate. You'll be shocked what God would do. Look at the old, look for example when Jesus was walking through the streets. There had to be a lot of sick people or people in need. One woman only one woman believed, and she touched the hem of his garments. She was healed because she believed. How many of us, when we were talking earlier about pressing to the mark, I probably pray for that as much as anything. Oh, God, give me faith to believe what you say. It matters not if there's an army the size of the Soviet Union or the American Empire or ISIS. There is no opposition that will stand against God. One verse I was just reading earlier this week in the book of Proverbs. There it says, there is no counsel. There is no plans. There is no understanding that can stand against God. The horse, he says, is prepared for the day of battle. 
but the Lord has the victory. There is nothing. Do you realize that? According to your faith, Jesus said. Listen to me. According to your faith, it's going to be to you. How much do you believe? That's exactly what you're going to get. He is not going to do more than what you believe. Has anybody gotten saved that did not believe? No. He will never save one man that does not believe. And he will not do one thing through you unless you believe. It's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is the substance. It says in Hebrew, it's the substance. It's the substance. May God open my heart. I don't know how, I don't know how much I'm in. Unbelief. I remember the one man said, I do believe, help my unbelief. That's what I pray. I do believe, help my unbelief. I don't even know how much I'm keeping God from moving in my life by my unbelief. But I know that that's through faith. So I cry out to God. I'm sorry, God. Why am I not believing you? Why is there... God, he gives me life. He breath. The sun is shining today because of him. One hand. He holds all things together. God is ready and more anxious than we to bring about his glory in every nation and in every generation. And God can change things overnight in any nation if he can only find Joseph's today. A Joseph today that will have faith in their God to rule the nations. You need to see his other brothers, they just tended sheep. They just stayed back and tended the sheep. In fact, they hated him because he had faith, of course. The man of faith will always be hated by all the other brothers. The godly man is usually always hated by all the other brothers. That was true from all the Old and New Testament combined. I mean, if you want to win a popularity contest, you don't want to have faith. If you really have faith, all the Christians will tend to, you're out, you're out of step. Look at Genesis to Revelation. Look at all the men of God. From Job, Moses, David, every one of them. Go, just go down the list. Paul, Peter, Jesus. <laughs> only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. Where are the Josephs today? Do we? Is there a Joseph? I remember when I was your age, and different ones were speaking when I would hear different messages. I remember one time a teenager, I went out and wept for hours. Everyone else stayed back and played games after the meeting was over. You only have one life. You've lost everything in the past. It's done. Was it good? Are you satisfied? Your past is done with. You're never going to get to redeem that again. For all eternity, it's gone. Are you happy? And I pray God will raise up a Joseph. Today, find a Joseph that will have faith in their God to rule a nation, to obey Jesus' great commission. He will do it today if only he can find a few committed Christians that grasp his vision and will proclaim it to the nation. For the eyes, look at this, the eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth looking for people whose hearts are perfect towards him so that he can show his great power in helping them. He's just looking all over the world to find anyone. Second Chronicles 16.9. You can be sure God's eyes are still open today and he's still searching today throughout the whole earth to find those he can show his great power in helping them. He is ready. Let's pray. God, we just commit this to you. We ask that you will give us hearts. Lord, we're just, who are we? Lord, I think it was said of David, but who is he? But he's just a dog. Little David, who is he? We think of Peter. We think of John, those little fishermen. Who, you, Jesus, you want me to follow you? Who am I? Remember Moses said, I can't, I can't talk, I can't speak. Remember 
Peter when Jesus, we were telling him to follow him. And he was wondering, he was concerned about somebody else following him. He didn't think about just following him himself and what you said. He said, what, what, he said, what about him? What about John? Still remember, Jesus, what you said to Peter. What is that to you? What does it matter whether John follows you or not? Peter, you follow me. What does it matter if nobody else, like that little song, though none follow you, I will follow you. God, I pray that you will somehow capture the heart of the ones you're looking for. Some, some woman in this room that will be an Esther. Some young man who will be a Joseph and will dream your word and believe it and wait and pursue in faith in Jesus' name. Amen.